Welcome to Brain and Vat. I need to start with a confession, which is that you have been watching for the last three years the fake Mark Oppenheimer. And today I'm going to bring you the real Mark Oppenheimer. And he's going to be talking to us about anti Semitism. Mark, would you like to start with a real life case? The real life case of anti Semitism that I spent a couple of years writing about was the deadliest anti Semitic attack in United States history. It was the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, October 27th, 2018. A gunman, which is always a term that sounds a little bit too heroic. It's a gunman sounds like a good person. sounds like someone who came to save you. A gunman entered the Tree of Life Synagogue building in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And of the 22 people inside, 11 were murdered. Two more were shot, but survived. And in the United States, which has been like South Africa, relatively free of anti-Semitic murders, in our case for coming up on 250 years of existence, this was an extraordinary shock. And by far the deadliest attack on Jews on American soil since before or after statehood. And the alleged perpetrator, Robert Bowers, is supposed to go to trial after many delays this May. So coming up on the fifth anniversary of the shooting. So there will be a lot of renewed attention to that killing in May if the trial goes forward, as I think this time it seems likely to. But the United States has had so many mass killings in involving guns since the Columbine attack in 1999, which was the first really famous mass killing, and it was a school shooting, so it seemed to be the starting point of something new and truly horrific. We've had, I forget if it's 300, 400, 500, but in the hundreds of killings in which several people or more have been killed by an assailant. And so most Americans, if you say the synagogue should be in Pittsburgh, they actually don't know what you're talking about because Every mass killing in America blends into the mass of mass killings in America. I often try this thought experiment with my audiences when I talk about my book, where I say, see, we have a mass killing sometimes once a week. Sometimes we go a month without one. COVID depressed the numbers. That was one nice side effect of COVID. But most Americans feel that they know of dozens or hundreds of them, which they, because they do in a sense. But when I say, try to think of 10 cities that have experienced mass killings since Columbine in 1999. Most people can't. They think of four or five very high profile ones, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Florida, the Parkland shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, maybe Charleston, the Mother Emanuel Church shooting in Charleston, because that was an attack on African-American church that left nine dead. If you included bombings like the Boston Marathon bombing, but then they quickly run out at about seven or eight and they can't even get to 10. So what that means is that while for American Jews, Tree of Life is singular, and for many of us, unforgettable because it was an attack on our specific subgroup. Most Americans actually don't remember that it happened, which is a very weird case of cognitive dissonance. So that's, the, that's a very, that's an all too real life case for you. So there's a sense in which many Jews that live in America had escaped persecution from their prior homelands, that they'd fled Nazi Germany. I have a cousin who lives in New York, whose mother had fled Nazi Germany. Others had left other pogroms over time. And America is seen as a safe haven for Jews that New York in particular is a large number of Jews and is, that Jewish culture is embedded in life in New York. But as far as I understand that if you go and look at how particular groups are targeted, Jews seem to still rank quite highly in terms of the number of anti-Semitic attacks, not necessarily all that result in death, other kinds of slurs used against them or exclusions from different places. What do you think? motivates this ongoing hatred against Jews? Is it something that's systematic or is it something that just happens to be the case that it's, it's an aberration of the data? The first thing is your premise is true, which is the United States is for many Jews, a, I mean, for mo most humans who have voluntarily immigrated here, which is pretty much all Americans who are here, except for the descendants of enslaved Africans. And obviously it's a little bit trickier if you're looking at Native Americans who historically came here voluntarily across the Bering Strait, but have suffered all kinds of oppression since. So those are categorically different groups in an important way, but of those who immigrated here voluntarily, and I should also say, and this is important in the South African context, that African Americans, who by the way, are increasingly not descendants of slaves because we have so much immigration from Jamaica, West Africa, and so forth, or not the descendant of people enslaved and brought to the United States than about 12 or 13% of the American population. And I know it's vastly higher in South Africa if I, that black people are much higher. So that's not to say it's not an important exception. And of course, the history of slavery, one that we live with today. But 
Most Americans by a wide margin are the descendants of people who came here voluntarily. They were often fleeing economic persecution, poverty, but often religious persecution. And of course, the country was founded by people, many of whom traced their origins here to the flight from Reformation era conflicts in England, the Netherlands, and so forth. So the United States really does have in its DNA a heritage of being a place where people come so as not to be killed for their religion. That's really important to who we are. And that's a real legacy. And by and large, it's a highly successful one. It is a tiny number of Americans of any faith, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, native, Hindu, whatever, a tiny minority of Americans who have suffered physical violence or been killed for any beliefs, really, including religious beliefs. Like I always say, this is the place where we came not to kill each other over ideological wars. And we've largely succeeded in that. And that's a huge, extraordinary human accomplishment. And then you have this paradox where, according to all sorts of really robust survey data, American Jews are both the most or the second most or tied for the first most respected and beloved minority group here, which is that people think that we are smart, philanthropic, non-criminal, good neighbors, by and large white, which pleases the racists among us and so forth, but then also are increasingly, and especially in the last five years, the religious minority, and I think actually the minority group most likely relative to our percentage of the population to be targeted for hate crimes, a category I don't like, by the way, and I think is not as useful as people think it is. So why is that? The first part is easy. Why are we well-liked? Well, this is a country that values whiteness, economic success, <laughs> has a soft spot for religious minorities, actually, in many ways. That's easy. Why are we... And then the stereotypes around us are, even when they're bad, they're kind of so good with money. Well, that's bad, but it's also can be flipped easily to be good, whereas the stereotypes around many other groups, criminality, stupidity, and so forth, there's not a flip side that looks good. Why is there this uptick in anti-Semitic violence, to your question? It is still the case that anti-Semitism seems to have a kind of unique endurance that is largely resistant to facts and is highly flexible. So communists think that Jews are, the, are successful capitalists. Capitalists think that Jews are successful communists. And patriots think that Jews are nefarious schemers within the patriotic jingoistic scheme. Patriots think that Jews are more likely to be treasonous. So, you know, that's a hard nut to crack. I don't have a great answer for why anti-Semitism seems to have this un unique endurance and flexibility. Um, there have been people who have attempted, I think Yuri Sleskind's book, he teaches at Stanford, which looks at sort of Jews as one of those groups, like ethnic Chinese, Mormons, one of the Indian subcasts, I forget, but there's a few groups that have maintained a private language while being minority populations in larger majority cultures. And that has scrambled the perceptions of people around the world and led people to think of them as these sort of particularly nefarious actors, but I'm not an expert on that stuff. So, but I will say you've correctly named the paradox in American life anyway. So two points. The one is that I don't know in America, but in South Africa, Jews traditionally were not considered white, which is very right. interesting. So they weren't considered black, but they were considered some sort of other category. But it, it has felt throughout South African history that Jews are whatever's not in vogue at the time. So. During apartheid, Jews were not white. Now that apartheid's over, Jews are white and whites are disliked in South Africa. So it's Jews that kind of fit whatever mold is right. disliked. I, sh I should say that in America, it is also true that Jews had to become white, but whiteness here was always more capacious. Even when the legal codification of it ended sooner, America's always had more different groups that it hasn't known what to do with than South Africa obviously has several, three or four large my, racial categories that in some ways were better managed by the racists or more cleanly managed than in the United States, where of course, and it, we have our own really weird history with what to consider people of Asian descent. There has been a Chinese minority here for well over a century, what to consider the status of Native Americans or Indians in places where there was slavery, for example. It's all very weird and tricky, but whiteness has been pretty capacious and white privilege was granted to Jews and Italians and Irish and other groups who weren't obviously white to the native Protestant population, a good coming, I would say a good century ago. Now that doesn't always mean that it was the best, that it was like 100% whiteness. It didn't necessarily mean that you got into the best country clubs or 
the best universities with the same ease, which is something that as I've done a podcast about the reception of Jews into the Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, et cetera, or eight old elite schools. But nevertheless, within our category, within our schema, we were whiter sooner than in a place like South Africa. It's a very interesting paradox. It's very interesting how these categories bleed. I once got engaged as a gay man to another gay man whose mother was very traditionally Afrikaans, which is uh -huh. a South African group mm -hmm. that sort of was empowered during apartheid. She was very traditional, quite racist, very religious. And when we got engaged, she, I'd met her many times. She was always very kind to me, but she was horrified that we got engaged because her son not because he got engaged to a man, but because he'd gotten engaged to someone who wasn't white because I'm Jewish, which I really would like, really blew my mind. This is like the old joke about the, I forget the actual punchline. I'm not going to tell it well. The joke is basically like, I've got bad news and good news. My son's, my son's gay and he's engaged to a man. The Jewish mother says he's gay and he's, my son comes home, he says he's engaged to a man, but the man's a doctor. So... The great stereotype that Jews just want their kids to marry doctors. So, yeah, I mean, that, by the way, so when Afrikaans are very religious, there are some sort of Dutch reformed Protestant. Is that what they are? That's yeah, Mark would probably know more, but I think so. It's a form of Christianity. And yeah, she didn't want her son to marry someone who wasn't white in her eyes. Well, I mean, I'm very... I have no soft spot for racism or xenophobia. I do have a soft spot in America for the old denominational system when Protestant groups that I have no particular attachment to nonetheless meant something to their own members. So that there used to be a deep kind of German Lutheran culture in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota. And it had to do with the foods you ate and the language you spoke and the, maybe even the college you sent your kids to. St. Olaf was Norwegian Lutherans and Gustavus Adolphus was Swedish Lutherans. And these are small colleges in the Midwest. And that was that charming. It seemed benign and charming. And that, of course, has all completely broken down. And today, your average Minnesotan of German extraction doesn't care one way or the other about her Lutheran heritage, mostly. So it was a very complex system here because we had so many immigrant groups. So if you went back to 1900, the Swedes really looked askance at the, Luth at the Norwegians who looked askance at the Danes. Who, and these were all European or Scandinavian Protestant farming peoples who had come to the same square thousand miles of land, but they had all sorts of mistrusts of each other that made for good novels. So there's a sense in which I've always found the loose category of white people a strange one, because you've got people from all around the world who worship different gods, who have different kinds of cultural practices, and to say, you're all the same has always struck me as odd. The other thing I wonder about with regards to anti-Semitism is it seems that Jews come in a variety of different flavors. So you have Jews who are openly non-believers in God, but you know, are Jews. Yep. Jews in terms of culture, tradition, yep. friends they have, maybe the preferences they have about who their kids marry. You have ultra-Orthodox Haredis who are going to dress differently, have very strongly different beliefs. And then you're going yep. to have a whole range of flavors in between. How does the anti-Semite reconcile this? It's one thing to say, I hate you because you know, of X attributes you have, but when the attributes are so, so diverse, well, one of the things you have to understand and about the, the anti-Semite, and I'm going to start saying it your way. I like anti-Semite better than anti-Semite. It sounds naughty or dirtier somehow. That is that he, I'll call him a he, there are plenty of female anti-Semites, doesn't, the Jews he knows or thinks he knows are not actual live Jews. They are the Jews of caricature. And this isn't a very, I don't mean this like, oh, bigots never really get to know real people, which is obviously true or sometimes true. Sometimes bigots know real black people or Jews. I mean it in a very, like, on the ground, meaningful way, which is that lots of anti-Semites have known very few Jews, or they've known only a small group of Jews, or they've known only one Jew, but they are not, some of them are, they do business with a whole bunch of Jews, or they live in a neighborhood with lots of Jews, and they have, and they don't like the, the Jews. But a lot of them, and I think especially your professional anti-Semites, your most convicted and zealous anti-Semites, are, don't really know, th their beliefs precede any actual Jews, and they come from legends handed down by their parents, stereotypes they imbibed in homogeneous Protestant or Catholic or Muslim communities. And so they don't, it's very rare to meet one of these Jew haters who has a finely grained sense of the Jewish community, 
But you, you will never hear someone say, well, I'm okay with reform and reconstructionist Jews and particularly those of Ashkenazi descent. But when I meet a Sephardi Jew or a Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jew, I just think they're a little bit, they're likely to cheat you in business. This is not something you hear. They don't know what any of those groupings mean, as of course, most non-Jews and including, and indeed most Jews don't. And so they, now they may actually have a very sophisticated knowledge of a very sophisticated or an unsophisticated misreading of Jewish texts. So the great British novelist Howard Jacobson, is it Jacobson or Jacobs? I always forget. But he has a wonderful uh, essay or maybe it's an interview where he points out that the anti-Semite lives in a hell of his own devising, which is he often has like volumes and volumes of Holocaust history on the shelves behind him. And he has issues, he has volumes of the Talmud. And this is because he's researching it because he has to like find the place in the Talmud where it says that the Jew doesn't like the Gentile. And he's trying to prove the Holocaust didn't happen. So he's bought every volume of Holocaust history. And, and Jacobson says, this is, this person has a richer Jewish library than almost any Jew in existence. He has his Talmud, he has Lewis Ginsburg's Legend of the Jews, he has his Mishnah, he has his Torah, he has his volumes of Holocaust and European history. And a lot of it is actually the reputable stuff, the real good books of history. He has a true Jewish studies PhDs library because he's obsessed with the Jews. And even that person is not obsessed with con his contemporary Jewish neighbors. He's, he's obsessed with a fictional or fictive accounting of who he thinks the kind of the echt Jew, the eternal Jew is. So how do they make sense of the fact that there's actually tremendous diversity among the Jews? They don't make sense of it. And of course, the point of this kind of bigotry is that you're, by definition, almost collapsing distinctions, that there aren't. Of course, they're thieving and murderous and conniving Jews. They're thievious and thievous and murder, thieving and murderous and conniving. Everybody's atheists, Christians, Muslims, Afrikaans, like all of it. The point of a kind of rock ribbed bigotry is that you don't see these distinctions. That to you, they're all the same, or they all underneath it are all the same. So, a skeptic about anti-Semitism might say something like this: They might say, "This is just what about meism?" So, every group can claim that people dislike them. So even a majority group. So Christians now today say that there's an enormous anti-Christian and anti-traditional movement against God, against Christian values, that our values are being undermined. Every group will say that there's instances of violence, instances of bigotry, inst instances of even institutionalized racism or anti-ethnic or anti-religious belief that apply to their group. And isn't this just an instance of, yes, bad things have happened to your group, but bad things happen to every group and why are Jews special? Well, Jews aren't special. Nobody ever said Jews are special. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what kind of dimwit would say something like that. Yes, bad things happen to all groups. It's important to understand why and offer compassion. And to the extent that the state or other actors can do stuff to minimize it, it's important to understand why it's happening to this group and not that group. So it's important. It's if you're looking at why a lot of young black men are shot with firearms in the United States with guns, it's important to understand that young black men are more likely to be shot with guns than other subgroups in the United States and to look at sociological reasons for why, because we don't want young black men to die of gunshots. I would never say to them, well, Jews get, Jews got shot in Pittsburgh. Well, that's true, but gun death is not a major problem for American Jews. At, by the same token, Jews are victimized in other different ways. And it's not some sort of, it's not sophisticated to look at this and, and as a kind of competition of a, some, what I call a misery derby, who gets across the finish line of a X number of misery units first. The important thing is to be analytically rigorous and say, what's happening and why? And certainly in all of the gun death in the United States anyway, that has occurred, there have been more people of Lutheran heritage murdered than Jews. There are a lot more people of Lutheran heritage in the United States, and they are represented in the population at large pretty substantially. And so if you looked at who's been shot at concerts, in post offices, at shopping malls, or in random acts of violence, no doubt more Lutherans have been killed. But there's no meaningful anti-Lutheran prejudice in the United States. And no Lutheran I know thinks that there is. But there is really meaningful anti-Jewish prejudice, and there's good evidence for it. So I'm not sure what sort of empirically minded person wouldn't take seriously anti-Semitism as a category. I mean, it, you could name it other things. You could call it Judeopathy or Jew hatred or whatever. But it names something 
that's real that we want to understand that's analytically different from why young black men die in in their neighborhoods and why lots of Lutherans have died in mass killings because of their general representation of the population. So I'm not even sure what the question is, except it sounds like the kind of thing that someone would say who just wants the Jews to shut up and stop complaining. Yeah, you could certainly interpret it that way. And I think there's a an uncharitable interpretation of the question, which is just a diversionary tactic and getting Jews to shut up about something really bad that is happening to them. But there is a more charitable interpretation. So the one question you might ask is, does the anti-Semite have a coherent view of Jews? And the reason why you might think not is along the lines that Mark was suggesting, that Jews are such a diverse group that it's impossible that every anti-Semite has the same concept of Jews when they're performing anti-Semitic acts. So there it seems like it's very weird to think that every anti-Semite is participating in the same phenomenon if that phenomenon can't be described. So, well, let me stop you there and I apologize, but I just, I don't want to lose track of this smart retort I'm about to give you, which is, it strikes me as a truism and therefore nonsensical that every anti-Semite is thinking something different because they're all unique humans with different minds. So of course they're all thinking something different. That, that raises the bar to say that, to demand that they're all thinking the same thing or have the same Jew in mind when they're doing it raises the bar impossibly high. And I would say almost like logically impossibly high. So that doesn't seem to me a useful way to think about it. The question is really is less to me whether there's some sort of ontological unity to the mind of the either the minds of all people I'm calling anti-Semites or all people who kill Jews because of their what they take to be their Jewishness. The question is more whether it helps us make sense of something in a useful way, particularly in regards to thwarting it or stopping it. So for example, if you know that anti-Semites are more likely to attack people who look traditionally observant, men who have on black hats that are commonly identified with certain Jewish communities, if you know that, and if you can figure out why they take those people to be Jews and what they have against those people and why they perceive people who look like that as being in conflict or having needs or wants that, that are in conflict with their own needs and wants, then you can help protect those people. And on a much, I'm far less interested in this, but incidentally, you might be able to help cure the anti-Semite of some of his anger or misconceptions. So it strikes me as a useful category, but not necessarily a sort of existentially necessary or true category. Let me back up and say, there's not a unified account, but I would say that, there, that if one wanted to talk about people who've committed anti-Semitic, quote, hate crimes, again, not a term I love, but that you would find several features of their thinking that are exceedingly common. And to demand any more than that, again, I would say is like, is acting in some sort of bad faith because again, all human beings have different minds and different vocabularies, they're gonna name things differently. But I think you would find that they would, there would be several features that they would, of their thinking that they would have in common that would be important to know. So, but again, I think we probably have a lot of common ground. I agree with that. So I'm skeptical about that. I'm skeptical that anti-Semites will have certain commonalities in their thinking. I'm even skeptical that Jews will have commonalities about what they think the Jewish people are in their thinking or the reason in virtue of which they're Jewish or their friends are Jewish or their family's Jewish. So I'm skeptical about all of that, but I want to come back to your Haredi example or mm -hmm. your Orthodox. So you've got the black hats and mm -hmm. you've got this hatred or this bigotry towards these people with black hats walking around. What's interesting is you say it's useful to understand that because you could take steps to alleviate it. And, and that makes sense to me. So if you've got like a pragmatic definition of anti-Semitism, that makes a lot of sense. But to even, alleviate there, it, think, even in so far as saying like it's useful for the black hatted people to know if they take their black hats off, they're less likely to be victimized. Sure. But even there, I think it might fail. So if, think, for example, about anti-sub-Jewish -sub attitudes in Israel. So you've got non-Haredis who might be quite anti-Haredi in Israel. Is that anti-Semitism? Nope, it doesn't seem to be, but it fits your definition, right? So you've got a group of people that, are, that, that have negative attitudes thrown at them, where maybe even policy is generated against them, but we wouldn't want to call it anti-Semitism, even though it resembles very similar attitudes elsewhere in the world, which you would want to call anti-Semitism. So there's just I would interrupt and say, I'm not particularly troubled by calling that anti-Semitism. 
by the way. Interesting. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know. And I think that, that there are plenty of anti-Semitic Jews. I don't tend to think of, it's not a category I would use for people who are proudly Jewish in certain ways. So in, in the American context, anti-Semitic Jews are usually fairly, see themselves as fairly estranged from their Judaism, deracinated, whatever you want to call it, and don't have a strong Jewish identity in the way that secular Israelis might have a strong Jewish identity, but not that kind. So it's, I might use it a little bit differently, but I'm not, I don't think that Jews can't be anti-Semitic. I think Jews can be anti-Semitic in the same way that I think black people can have racist attitudes toward black people in the same way that I think that I've known gay people who are definitely homophobic. So I'm not as troubled by that uh, as you are. That strikes me as if that's what we need to make sense of the term, that strikes me as like a perfectly acceptable, weird, somewhat weird, but acceptable wrinkle in the semantics of that term. So, yeah, that doesn't strike me as some sort of fatal problem for the way I think of anti-Semitism. Let me add one more thing. This is for Jason's benefit. I actually think most Jews do have a similar conception of what Judaism is. They don't all know that they do. I think that most Jews, when they say they're Jewish, are saying that they have a familial connection, either literal or metaphorical, but quite often literal. And metaphorical only in the sense that they might say, well, I can't actually prove that I'm descended from these Jews at Sinai. But they sense, a they, they, for them, the, op, it, the idea of kinship is operative in and they understand themselves to be cousins, however distant or immediate, of other people who identify themselves as Jews. So, and this is a different conception from nation, it's a different, which is, it can be a very elective affinity. I think it's different from tribe, I'm never sure how tribe operated, but it strikes me as they see themselves as part of a, a kinship network that holds certain common texts to be uniquely important. That doesn't mean they individually hold those texts to be uniquely important, but they understand that their kinship network has certain texts that are uniquely important in a kind of normative way. So I think now, does every, if you query a nine-year-old, if you query my nine-year-old daughter on Judaism, is that what the answer she'll give you? No. If you query your average 50-year-old secular Jew or even a Haredi Jew who might just say, I'm doing it because God tells me to, but hasn't thought more deeply than that. No. But I actually think that's what they think they're doing. So that's weird. I don't know if I believe in unconscious beliefs like that. And also you gloss well, over your nine-year-old daughter, but she's a Jew and it's an important case, right? Well, sure. So is my four-year-old son. How far are you going to, how far are we going to push that? That when they come out well, of the womb, they don't, I exactly. think that, that's, that's why belief can't be the criterion for being Jewish. Huh. I think there can be ascribed identities. I don't see why not. I think there are people who are obviously black who may not think themselves black, either because they have philosophical objections to it, because they have delusions, because, because they've seen much, much darker people. But I, that doesn't strike me as an insoluble problem. It doesn't mean that around the margins, you'll capture everybody. You might not capture the infant and you might not capture the very light-skinned person who has not had certain meaningful formative experiences in black community, right? There might be people you lose by that, but again, to demand that it like, that it work for every single case is I think, I just think that's a kind of an unnecessary mistake. You don't have to have, because we're not, it's not a science, right? And I think most people who think about group affinity among humans don't think it's a science. So that's not the criteria they're asking to be judged on. What's interesting about this is a sense in which Jews will have different rules for who counts as a Jew. The famous one from Ben Gurion is anyone who has enough chutzpah to call themselves a Jew is a Jew. And this is said like in a post-Holocaust way, right? So the Nazis had a particular way of determining whether you were Jewish and it was determined on bloodline. So you could have someone who viewed themselves as a devout Catholic, that their kids were Catholic, their parents were Catholic, but their grandparents were Jewish. And as much as they might have reject, rejected that faith and not seen themselves as Jews, the Nazis did, and they got put into gas chambers like everybody else. And then you can have a Haredi line which says, well, the question is, is your mother Jewish? That's the sole determinant. It's not about beliefs. It's not about kinship. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is that we have these overlapping things. And so Jason's PhD thesis on social groups and is skeptical about the phenomenon, and I think doesn't like the idea of these cluster concepts where you can say, well, if you have enough of this and enough of that, then, you know, you meet the criterion of anti or Jew. Can I go just back very quickly? So what would you say about the person, Jason, who says that he's an anti-Semite, the sort of white nationalist douchebag who maybe hates blacks, but there are no blacks in his neighborhood. And his singular purpose in life is to like ferret out truths about lying, scheming Jews, and if possible, make them suffer for it. What would you tell him? <laughs> so is your question to me, is he an anti-Semite? 
Yeah. What if you said what are his, what's his belief system? How would you just describe all these things about Jews, but you wouldn't use the term? So I don't deny that people have beliefs. I think they do. I think he believes they are Jews. I think he's wrong that they are Jews. He believes that Jews have certain properties. I think he's wrong that Jews have certain properties. I think he believes that certain things should happen to Jews. I think he's wrong about that. So I think he has a series of false beliefs. Okay. The question then, the bigger question is, is that part of a phenomenon? So are there a whole lot of people like him that we can group together to say that yeah. they are anti-Semites? And that's where I think the error happens. Okay. So I think it's true that someone walks into a synagogue and shoots a whole lot of people because he believes they're Jewish and because he believes bad things should happen to them. I'm not denying that the event happens. I'm not denying that terrible harm occurs to people who believe they're Jewish. I'm not denying that an atrocity has taken place. I'm not denying that something terrible has happened. Terrible things happen all the time. But I'm just, I'm denying that it's part of a bigger phenomenon. I understand. Let me say this. I think there are far fewer anti-Semites than most people in, in, in my world think there are. I'll meet you there, right? I'm not sure why you would tell this person, say that this person and the group of people he gets together with specifically to say horrible things about Jews twice a week over beers aren't anti-Semites. That strikes me as... I mean, it strikes me as like both silly and precious, but also like philosophically mistaken in ways we could get into and would have fun doing that. But I think there are fewer of way fewer of them than the anti-Semitism like activists want to say there are often for fundraising purposes. So I'll grant you that much. Yeah, I think a softer version of the anti-Semitic claim is that you just raise the bar for what counts. So you might say like only someone who has very identifiable attitudes that we can list counts. Let me come at it from a different direction and just say, I think all human beings naturally have all sorts of mistaken prejudices and that there is a version of the anti-anti-Semitism camp that essentially captures all human beings, including Jews, as anti-Semites and therefore reduces the claim that they're anti-Semites to meaninglessness. And I am troubled by that community as well, but I'm not ready to say, therefore, the term is bogus. But anyway. I'm wanting to say something stronger, though. I'm wanting to say that if you find the dyed in the wool anti Semites, right? So the real nasties, and you put them all in a pub, and you were to go around and ask two questions deep, just two questions deep. So, question one What exactly is this Jew that you have in mind? Right. Like, what is it? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what exactly do you think should happen to this Jew? I think you'll get completely different answers right through the pub. And that's why I'm skeptical that, that this is a unified group, that this is a unified right. phenomenon. I think they could pretty quickly come to a sort of statement of principles that would be pretty terrifying. But it would take some team building work. I'm not saying they wouldn't need, and they might not be the right people to, they, it might be that this community of people, for, to get them to the five drinks they would need to come up with that statement of principles would actually get them to the five drinks they need to actually bash each other's faces in. So you may, for anthropological reasons, you might win that, that bet with me. <laughs> I will also say, by the way, that like, I think a lot of tests for what's a Jew completely fail. I am a lot of the listeners of my podcast of Unorthodox want Jews to be people who have a kind of mid-century Ashkenazi cuisine. Well, if you like bagels and cream cheese, and if you enjoy, and then 40 years later, you're watching Seinfeld. And if you like are funny and don't mind people interrupting you, you're Jewish. And I think that's totally silly. I really do. And I think, and I, I similarly object to, and there's some interesting scholarship on Judaism as nostalgia. I similarly object to a Judaism that makes very strong claims that like there's an authentic Judaism to be found in a backward looking nostalgia for like what your grandma did. And there's some interesting historical scholarship about, from an empirical perspective, how many Jews will say, when you ask them to describe their Judaism, will give answers that essentially are, I enjoy partaking of certain nostalgia, but they have no sort of affirmative or forward-looking claims of what they want to do as Jews or what Judaism ought to be today or 50 years from now. And they have no particular claim for why it should have any continuity because except as a sort of like rump group of nostalgians, of curators of like antiquarian comedies or something. And I think those are really mistaken notions of what Judaism is. So I'm actually willing to say a lot of them are philosophically incoherent. They won't work empirically and they like don't, and they describe very few people among other things, right? If you make it a kind of wry Ashkenazi, Borscht Belt comedian, mid-century American pop culture Judaism, you've written out, you're absolutely writing out Sephardi Jews, Persian Jews, 
Israeli Jews, like all sorts of Jews to whom that is not a recognizable personality type. So right away, you've basically said you've reduced Judaism to what, how it was portrayed in American TV comedies, 20 or 30 year period. And I agree, that's totally philosophically, we have to do much, much better than that. Yeah. So speaking about the Jewish comedy, I mean, there is this rich tradition of Jews being very funny and making fun of themselves. And I, I wonder... am fucking hilarious, for example. <laughs> exactly. Like, I don't know about you, like for me, yes, that is my tradition is like, I am funny. <laughs> Do you think that gives you license being a Jew? Like, do I get to make jokes about kikes because I'm a Jew? Whereas if, you know, <laughs> some fake Jew says this sort of stuff, well, then we say, no, you're anti Semite. Does it give you like a buffer? We can say maybe that's coherent to oh. have anti Semitic Jews, but. Yes. Oh, certainly members of the in group get a little more permission. And again, I actually am not going to claim, I'm not going to make claims as to whether or not this is right. What I'm going to say is that it's true that more people are less offended when somebody who's identified with the group makes the joke. That doesn't get you very far. The most interesting thing to me about a lot of the anti-Jewish epithets, kike, shini, yid, heeb, is they don't really exist anymore. That actually, unlike, say, the N-word for African-Americans, and unlike, I'm sure there are other terms that, frankly, I'm just not hearing, because nobody I know uses these terms. I, I, I think that on the far right and the far left, there's a misunderstanding that like, the average normie in the middle uses or hears really racist terms. And the reality is, if I'm playing poker with my six or seven friends, as we're going to next Sunday, nobody would drop these terms, even in a kind of ironic way. They're seen as so toxic and so unusable. So I don't know what's current out there for most groups. What I can say is for Jews, my kids don't know these words. They literally have never heard anyone say kite. They haven't heard it on the schoolyard. And I, they are often in situations where they are the only Jews in the room, where we don't live in a heavily Jewish area. They've all gone to public school not exclusively, but for many, many years between them. So, which I don't know how it is in South Africa, public school, of course, the United States means state run. In England, public school means Eton, means the fancy private school. They've never heard people might, the epithet for Jews is Jew, you dirty Jew, you stingy Jew, Jews like money. How was copper wire invented? Two Jews discovered a penny. That's, they just use Jew, but nobody has these kind of interesting, salty, spicy, mid 20th century crude words for Jew. So that's interesting, right? That actually anti-Judaism is not in vogue enough that there's any community of people where the kind of bigoted dad is passing on to his bigoted son, those fucking kikes, right? Maybe in the Ku Klux Klan world, maybe in real, there are small micro community of committed, convicted white supremacists and anti-Semites, you know, who have Nazi flags on their walls. I think there's probably only a few hundred of those people in America. Maybe it's in the four figures, but it's tiny, but they exist. But outside of those worlds, is anyone using the K word? <laughs> Not at me and I'm pretty visible. So yeah, I don't want to diminish the experiences of people to whom it's happened and it happens, but we're a country of 330 million people. And the amount that it happens has diminished so much in a century that I think that's notable. So speaking of that, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that you've been working on this fantastic podcast called Gate Crashes about the history of Jews in the Ivy League. What were the sort of systemic ways in which Jews were treated differently in those systems? Oh my God, this is so interesting. So the one minute version is that around the time of World War I, a lot of these schools realized they'd become very Jewish. That is to say, from 1900 to 19, say 15, the number of Jews in their undergraduate populations had gone from one or two or 3% to in some cases, maybe 15 or 20% because the children of immigrants were getting a certain generation that was born here, was coming of age in high school, figuring they could go to these schools, which by the way, were fairly cheap back then. They were not price prohibitive and they began applying and getting in. And so to keep them out, these schools, first Columbia University, soon thereafter, Yale, Princeton and Harvard and some others basically developed the, what looks like the contemporary American college application. So they started asking what had been just a one page form where you wrote a check and your name became a multi page form that asked, what does your father do for a living? That basically investigated what's your economic background? What's your ethnic background? Questions they still ask today, but for other, what are seen as more progressive reasons, but have always been on the application. They were trying to figure out if you were Jewish. They created the college interview in part to help figure out when they met you. Did you sound like you had an ethnic accent? Did you sound like a first generation American? They created categories still with us like geographical diversity, 
Ivy League schools want to say we have students from all 50 states in the United States and from 50 countries or whatever. That goal to get kids from all 50 states was a goal to get more Christians because Jews were so heavily concentrated in New York, Massachusetts, certainly Northeastern places. If you said, well, we want students from Washington State in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, California, Idaho, Wisconsin, what you were saying was we want more Gentiles. So they essentially created all these categories that back then were code for Christian. And those categories are still with us, but they've been flipped and turned into virtues. Now, when you say we have students from all 50 states, you're saying, look, we're so broad-minded. We have diversity. But that diversity was initially supposed to be anti-diversity. It was, we're going to go look for where the Christians are. So that's what it was about. And our podcast, Gatecrashers, is really about the very beautiful American effort to overcome those barriers and how Jews eventually won acceptance as, I guess you could say, as just normal white people at a time when these schools were still somewhat more closed to racial minorities. And today, and so by the time you get to when I was in college in the 1990s, Jews were perhaps 20%, 25% of many of these campuses. It has since gone way back down for reasons that we explore, but that's the story. So I I don't know the particulars of the case. It's it's a fascinating discussion. It, and it's, it brings up some similar philosophical problems to questions around exclusion of other racial groups throughout history from certain activities. And one of the important questions, is there a difference between direct and indirect racism or direct or indirect bigotry or discrimination? So let's say you come up with a bunch of policies Mm -hmm. that it just so happens would exclude groups, certain groups. So one of the examples is you only include people with blue eyes Mm -hmm. in your courses, and that just happens to exclude black people. Is that as racist as saying we won't include black people in this course? So, so is indirect racism as bad and does it matter what was going on in the mind of the policymaker at the time? So you, for example, you've given a few different policies that excluded groups. Does it matter whether that was the intention or not, Mm -hmm. or whether Mm -hmm. that was just the effect? Uh, So. I think they both matter and to differing degrees. I wish that there was, I I understand exactly what you're asking. I think there are clearly policies that are discriminatory in their effect that we nevertheless want to have in place, right? I think that there are, so for example, my wife went to Stuyvesant High School in New York City, one of the most selective high, it's a public exam high school in New York City. You get in because you ace a test. And it used to be overwhelmingly Jewish. It's now overwhelmingly descendants of East Asian and South Asian immigrants. And there's no question but that it's discriminatory in its effect. There are certain groups that are underrepresented, especially given the popula- the relevant population, which is New York City ju- middle school students taking the test. Certain ethnic group, racial groups are underrepresented. By the way, I imagine boys are underrepresented at this point fairly substantially. I know that we know that at the elite university level, I'm not sure what we know about high schools, at the elite university level, there is substantial affirmative action now for, to keep schools 50% male. If you didn't have, if you weren't putting your finger on the scales, I think they would, many of them would drift up to 55, 60, 65% female because girls do so much better in school now in the United States. So nevertheless, do I think it's valuable to have in a large school system with many high schools, do I think it's valuable to have a few of them? I think there are eight in New York City that are do admissions principally by exam, despite, and then let the chips fall where they may? Absolutely. I think that's a valuable thing to have in a diverse school system where there are many options for high school. Should some of them be for the exam superstars? Yes. I think that the problem with, so that's better for me than Yale administrators saying, we want more people whose dads went to Yale, which is one of the ways they ensured the sort of continuance of the Protestant hegemony. So that is definitely more acceptable to me than Yale administrators getting together and saying, we want a legacy preference. And they knew, and everyone else knew, it was to perpetuate the, the Protestant hegemony among the, sort of the undergraduate student body. Now, is that problematic? Is that more problematic because of the kind of evil lurking within or is it more problematic because as a sociological fact, when you see it, you're aware that, some, that they're really bad people, that it's a more unpleasant fact to encounter because of what it says about the people making the decision and the, the power structures in society? I'm not sure. 
And I think that's a really interesting question, right? So it might be that if it was pure, that these things, when they're purely accidental, are less disturbing than when they alert us to unpleasantnesses that we didn't want to know about, unpleasant loci of intentionality. It is certainly the case that if you look at the history of Jews in the Ivy League and the attempt to exclude them, among other things, what you were looking at was a very real evidentiary paper trail of how certain people said, we want to keep admitting certain kids because of who their daddies are. It's hard to see how that's like defensible. You can make defenses for it, but at the very least, at the very least, one problem we're encountering is dishonesty. Because what the Ivy League administrators didn't do is say to the public, they said to each other, but they didn't say to the public, clearly we need fewer Jews. There are just too many Jews around. Let's figure out what policies we can put in place, explicit or implicit, to reduce the number of Jews. And then people could accept that or not accept that and apply or not apply and judge them for who they were. And then America could say, okay, well, that's what something that's useful knowledge about how Columbia College of Columbia University operates. But I don't think there's any excuse for the subterfuge, right? That subterfuge seems to always add a kind of poison pill of immorality to it. Do you think that's right? Yeah, it seems like it come out in different ways that the naked hatred seems like a pretty terrible thing. Uh, the accidental discrimination where you've got some neutral rule that happens to discriminate against a certain group, we feel is forgivable. And then the one where you're making some efforts to hide, up, to hide the hatred by producing rules that will have disparate impact. But really, everyone behind the scenes knows if we up the number of Wisconsin kids, we can keep those stinking kikes out of our place. I, I wonder, as you say, there's something in the subterfuge that feels quite poisonous. What's interesting is that we have a modern phenomenon that's going on at Harvard, where, as you mentioned, the newly ascendant group being East Asians, their numbers are capped through various mechanisms and there's ongoing litigation. Oh, surely. And I've been very much on record, both in the Harvard episode of our podcast. Well, I, don't, I guess I don't say it there, but I've been interviewed by the New York Times. I'm not sure if they use this quote or not, but I'm always the first to say that whatever you think of the effects of affirmative action at Harvard and the University of North Carolina, which is also part of that lawsuit, um, one thing that's indefensible is the lying that goes on. And that it would be far, and in fact, Jeannie Suk Gerson, who's an East Asian ancestry and is a professor at Harvard Law School, I think comes right up. I'm not sure if she actually says this or if she just floats it as a sort of thought experiment, but the implication seems to be she thinks it's a better idea that she, that she always makes people aware there is a European system where many places have explicit quotas and say, yeah, we're not going to admit another ethnic German until we get one more Turk because we have to hit this quota. And I think that there are parliaments in Europe that say we have to be X percentage female, for example. And there's an argument that just saying it takes away a lot of the stench because people know, okay, the society's made this decision that we have to be diverse in these particular ways. What in the American elite universities right now is tremendous amounts of lying because we have this national ethos of fair play that doesn't really admit affirmative action in that way. So we say, well, it only, everyone, we only do it based it on objective quali qualifications. And then in reality, these schools all end up, the elite schools that can get whom they want and pay to get whom they want, all end up at about 12 or 13% African-American, which is the percentage of blacks in the population. They all end up 50% male and female, which of course gives the whole game away. What are the odds that if you just looked at scores, grades, personal qualities, you'd be half male, half female every year. It used to be that men had so much more access to privilege. Now women are outperforming men in substantial ways. We know from standardized tests. So the lying is certainly what I think is most troubling in America right now. So in South Africa, we've taken this line that you should have demographic representativity, and that is part of the ethos. And I find that even more dangerous. The idea that because there are other people who happen to look like me, that should limit my career aspect, aspiration seems sickening. We have it particularly in my profession as an advocate. At one point, we would admit 100 pupils to be trained, and only 2% of our population come from India. If they said we can only take two Indians into the population seems incredibly unfair to punish the third Indian by saying, well, we already have enough of you people here. Now, at least in America, as you say, there is some sense in which to do that would be a bitter pill to swallow and that meritocracy is still meant to be the value that reigns. And so you lie about it and pretend that's not what's going on because at least there's a recognition that demographic representativity is a kind of bad thing. I think, I think that hypocrisy has its uses. The other point, the United States is a very different place. I'm always amazed at how few schools there are in places like Canada and South Africa. Israel has a handful, like I think you can count on two hands, 
the number of places you can get an elite university education, which seems small even for their small population, and which is why so many of them go to the United States for school. We are a country of 330 million people that has so many universities that new one, that, that old universities are folding all the time. Right now, there are a lot of universities that are essentially open admission, that are taking students from abroad who can pay full freight just to stay open, just to fill their beds. And every week, a new university announces they're closing their doors. We way overbuilt in the aftermath of World War II when the government gave the veterans on the, what was called the GI Bill, GI Bill of Rights, had substantial tuition assistance. A lot of new schools opened that many of them public schools, some of them private, that we can't sustain. But there is no person who can come up with a little money who can't find a place in some four-year college in America. And by the way, the bar, the here is there, the people admitted to practice law, is still incredibly capacious. There, there's no, there is no meaningful group that has 100 spots that, that, such that you couldn't go practice the thing you wanted except I might be a little bit off here in terms of medical school resident, post-medical school residencies, spots in what they call residency, which is the training program you go into after finishing four years of medical school. And there are finite numbers of medical schools and finite number of spots, and we need more. We don't have enough doctors per capita, and which is why we import so many doctors. So, but by and large, there's room enough for all. So what we're fighting over is the ability to go to Harvard College versus Georgetown or Georgetown versus the University of California at Santa Cruz or what, all of which are super good schools. So to, to cap off the conversation, I think a, an interesting question is you mentioned earlier that it's important to catalog anti-Semitism because it can be prevented in future. What? No, well, I'm not inter alia, right? It's also important to catalog things to just know things, right? So I am very interested. There's no sense in which you could talk about the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting without recounting what he, the reason he said he was going to kill people, which was they're Jews and Jews bring in immigrants, he said, and immigrants are bad, he said. So we could quarrel over whether it's useful for the FBI or the Anti-Defamation League to track that in a category of things they call hate crimes. But it's important as people who care about knowing true stuff to know why he said he was doing it. Sure. So given that we catalog a number of these events, what are the sort of patterns that you see that could be engaged with at a societal level? So what are the sort of pictures or sets of beliefs that people have that you think we could undermine yeah. or maybe re-educate or I'm not That's sure That's a really great question. I have very dim hopes for, you'll notice that I'm not, I don't think I'm making, and I apologize if I was making strong claims for the utility of thinking in a group-based mindset here. It is certainly useful to know on a kind of almost a priori level that if you go out looking like a Haredi Jew in certain neighborhoods, you're more likely to get punched in the face than if you don't go out looking like a Haredi Jew, right? That's just common sense, right? That said, almost every program I see that it purports to heal anti-Semitism or bigotry or make people open-minded or increase love or decrease hate strikes me as dumb and doomed to fail in the face of it. My friend Dara Horn has an article in The Atlantic Magazine this week about the harm that Holocaust education does. And everything, of course, diverts resources from somewhere else. And every time you put a mandate in the schools to teach about genocide at the 10th grade level, you're not teaching Shakespeare or math or even maths, as you guys would say. So I take a very dim view of our ability to educate or program people out of dumb beliefs. And I think that all of the kind of purported arbiters of it, the people who want to sell you programs, on how to decrease hate or increase comedy or whatever, comedy, are uh, mostly hucksters. Um, and I often say it's not the job of Jews or anyone to cure anti-Semitism. It's the job of all of us to make sure people don't shoot people and punch people. But I don't think that thought re-education is something any of us have really mastered. Let me offer two caveats. Number one, I do think that a starting point for being a cultured, civilized person who doesn't have really dumb beliefs one starting point, not the only one, and there are people who are their counterexamples, but one starting point is knowing history fairly well. So at least knowing. So if you understand the history of America, if you understand American history, I think you are probably somewhat less likely to be a kind of naked race, anti-black racist, and probably somewhat more likely to come at all of your convictions with a little more humility and a little more civility in your political prescriptions, let's say. 
like the worst kind of thinking seems to come from people who also seem to be awash in total ignorance. That doesn't mean that educated people are civilized and it doesn't mean that uneducated people aren't sometimes, or it doesn't mean that they're barbaric, right? But I think there's a tendency that we could look at the very large level. The second thing I'll say is there do seem to be countries that have far less and groups, whether it's just geographical or however you want to name it, Jason, that have far less of this poison or certain poisons than others. I'm just like Canada has far less um, what we would call hate crime, but you might even just call it crime <laughs> than the United States. Some of it's accountable for gun because of our we have a lot of guns, but take guns out of it and just say like the amount of people drawing swastikas, whatever that means on buildings. The amount of people who think that running a political campaign that has anti-Semitic dog whistles in it will be effective, right? You can search for what, there are countries where that just doesn't seem to work as well. So it could be that if we get more sophisticated social science or smarter people than me or you, that somebody could say, why is there less of X in the country we call Denmark or Canada than there is in the country we call the United States or Algeria or whatever? And that seems to me a line worth pursuing. I I wonder about how much we should conflate anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So it seems like there's going to be cases where it's legitimate to be critical about the Israeli government. Sure. Many Israelis are critical of their own government. They're currently taking to the streets protesting judicial reform in their tens of thousands. But there also seems to be a line where if people are boycotting that state for X reason, but would never do that to any other state that was doing the same thing, we start to wonder, well, is it just because you hate Jews? Right. And that anti-Zionism is just a, yeah. a cover for it. I, I take a, I am a very, I think like you, I tend to be something of an absolutist when it comes to free speech, both. I don't want the state squashing free speech. And I also don't want social customs squashing certain discussions that we have to have. So I'm all for inviting almost anybody to campuses. And I take a very broad, I really don't want discourse to be throwing around anti-Semite at people who are trying to talk about Israeli policy. I have, however, moved somewhat more toward an acknowledgement that there is something troubling about a lot of the anti-Zionist discourse, really for the reason that you're talking about. That So the, I think it was, what was it? It was at Columbia University, where in, recently, in the last couple of weeks, where a lot of professors objected to Columbia launching some sort of joint initiative with Tel Aviv University, saying this reifies settler colonialism and the settlements and so forth and so on. And I actually didn't read, I will, let me confess up front, like I'm not an expert on what went down there or what, and then there was a counter letter signed by some other people. But it is notable that Columbia does, as Yale does, as many universities do, have all sorts of warm collaborations with China, which is unquestionably a worse human rights abuser and a worse abuser of its own citizens, including its elite citizens in terms of cutting down on freedom of speech and the fear they live under than Israel is. and. That doesn't mean the criticisms of Israel are wrong, but again, as people who want to know true things, we do want to know why so many people who purport to be interested in human rights are so indifferent to the human rights of the Chinese and so interested in human rights violations, including some very real ones in Israel. And do I think that for many of them, that has to do with a both a sort of condescending orientalist benign view of what they see as people of color, which include their own Chinese students, many of whom, you know, come from mainland China, and a sense that you can't say enough bad things about these diaspora Jews or the Zionists. I do. And I say that based on both the lack of a better explanation for this phenomenon and also having just known some of them who might take to be anti-Semites. <laughs> so... I think that's a thorny one, right? Like it is one of the examples, one of the counterexamples I choose is what would, how would black students feel if there were a nation, a worldwide effort, let's say when Nigeria was at the worst of its human rights abuses, if the number one topic on campuses in the eighties, let's say was Nigeria and the gangland warfare that made Jamaica one of the most deadly places in the world. But nobody was talking about, let's say the settlements in the West Bank or Brezhnev's or, and drop-offs or Chernyanko's oppression of tens of millions of people in Russia, right? Like commun the communist bloc didn't exist, but Jamaica was a substantial human rights crisis. I think a lot of black students would say, wait a second, this feels a little racist. <laughs>
Mm. And I think we have to account for like these winds of like it's interest at the very least. It's an interesting question to ask. Doesn't mean that Israel gets off the hook. But if you want to understand what's going on a college campus, you're not at liberty to ignore that weird sort of discrepancy. Is your view one that others share? Is it a school of thought or did you come up with it? So it's mine, but it has bled. So it's bled into philosophy of race specifically. So there are a number of philosophers, maybe close to a majority now, who don't believe in the existence of race. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. So um, one of the really interesting things there, by the way, sorry to interrupt, I have noticed, and I've said to college students today, when I was in college, the, for lack of a better term, the hip move was to say race is a fiction, was for students to refuse to check boxes, interracial students especially, would say, I'm not going to check white and black, I'm just, and Asian, I'm just going to check none of the above. The hip thing was to say, look, increasing, vastly increasing numbers, exponentially increasing numbers of Americans are not just white or not just black, however you define it, they're multi multiracial, and therefore we are gleefully moving towards a world where these categories become non-existent because they're silly and they're pernicious. And that was a kind of like, that was the kind of progressive, enlightened thing to say. And it then completely flipped. Whereas today, if you say race is a fiction, that is seen as a white supremacist thing to say, you're speaking from a place of privilege. Of course you can say that, but for those of us who live it, it is the realest thing you can possibly talk about. And which, and I actually think both kind of extremes are probably a little bit fundamentalist for my taste, but it is interesting to me as a fact on the ground, how just the discourse that got you the most likes or whatever, live virtual or just claps on the back, completely flipped, completely. It's fascinating. My, my position actually started with the Jewish people. So my matric speech was on why there aren't Jews at a Jewish day school. And then... I've always believed this, that there aren't groups. And later when I got to master's PhD, I did a study of it. And it's not a, it's not a position in the literature. The, it's called eliminative individualism, that there's only individuals and no groups. There's equivalent positions in other areas of philosophy. There's no mind, there's just a body. But there's no, no one holds that view, at least at the time of me writing the PhD. So, so you know, I'm definitely in the minority, in the severe minority on this. I, it may be useful to you going forward. I realize I'm not going to change your mind. But when I talk about what Jews are, I always say, because Jews are always looking for a new metaphor for Jews. Are we a tribe? Are we a family? Are we a people who just like, are we a theology? Are we a this or that? Are we a group that's only been created by Nazis to define us? I always say that to me, the most sensible one is that we are a family. And again, families aren't all related by blood. People are adopted. People marry in. But of course, you might say there's no such thing as a family either, but I would say that we are a family that orients itself around the sort of perpetuation of a unique set of texts, like that that's the job. I think those kind of definitions, as you say, will be useful in capturing many Jews. Yeah. But I think they might, cap they might not capture a lot. And I don't just mean like extraordinary cases, maybe close to half. Right? No, I think you're, I actually think you're right. And in some ways, what I'm doing is making a normative case that more Jews ascribe, who think of themselves as Jews, realize they have to ascribe to that. One other yeah. thing I'll point out, then I should really go, is that DNA evidence given is going to actually be a problem for the people who want it to be only matrilineal descent. Because at some point, we'll get sophisticated enough to realize that the grand rebbe of wherever, that his mother was Jewish, his mother's mother, but if you, if 20 mothers back, she wasn't Jewish, the whole line is fucked. That's interesting. So we're actually going to discover that even the people who think that they have the most like Mahmir strict, clear definition, mm -hmm. that some enormous, it's not just that a lot of us will discover that we are Jews by that definition. A lot of people who are the most like Haredi, Yeshivasha, Rabbanim will discover they're not Jews by that definition. So that definition doesn't work. And they're the ones who think it works most clearly. That's a lovely objection. I had never thought of that. And it's a very nice yeah. objection. So we all yeah. have to do better. Either we fail or we have to do better than that one.